This life was all I ever wanted. I'm not leaving. Not yet. I was hoping you'd say that. We gotta hit the streets, make some money. People like us must destroy people like him. Buckle up. Get Showtime free at Showtime.com. My brother Jack. Oh my God, we back. Let's go. All the smoke. Just getting started, baby. Just getting started. Welcome back to a special quarantine edition of All the Smoke. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles. Jack's coming to you from the ATL. We got a special guest today, man. Um, Last name. One of the one of the greatest assist men of all time. Former Golden State Warrior head coach. Um, and now to me, one of the best uh, basketball analysts and minds um, in the game. That's his uh, new name, I, The Mind. <laughs> him and uh, Jeff Van Gundy's chemistry is shit, similar to me and Jack's. Uh, I love watching them do. So, man, a special welcome, a special thanks to Mark Jackson. We I just gave you a new that. nickname, OG, The Mind. I just gave you a new nickname, The Mind. <laughs> I, I did hear that. I appreciate that. That's a heck of a compliment. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> how are you uh, staying busy? You, uh, you, obviously, is your family safe? And how are you staying busy during this time? Yeah, thanks for asking. And pray the same goes for you guys and your families. But just uh, a lot of quality time, just hanging at the house, spending time watching shows and beating them in spades. Uh, but just, just <laughs> enjoying the time that we have as a family to, to be together. It's a tough time for everybody, but this too shall pass. Absolutely. We, uh, you know, Jack and I spoke on this too. You know, we're just enjoying the downtime, being around our loved ones, because even though obviously we, play, we all played long careers, we're all still in this next kind of uh, analyst broadcasting business. So we're traveling across the country all the time. So it's, it's good to kind of sit down. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation and reason why, but uh, just the fact to be able to sit down and spend time with our family has been amazing for me as well. Well, you think about it. We go our whole careers waiting for the opportunity to one day retire or finish playing and we think we're going to settle down and all of a sudden I'm running all around the country being an analyst and you guys now with your big time TV show and doing a heck of a job but you're all over the place so this is a good time to spend around the family and just you know enjoy the kids. Absolutely. Talk to us a little bit uh, the difference between being an analyst now um, and being a head coach in the NBA. Well the big difference is the competitive edge. As an analyst I'm winning every single night. Win, lose, or draw, I'm not mad. I don't have to worry about making adjustments or anything like that. As a coach, uh, you're, you're always thinking, even, even when you're winning, you're thinking, how can we get better? What did we do that maybe won tonight's game but won't win a game against you know, the Clippers or the Lakers or the Bucks? So you're constantly thinking about getting better. So I don't have that competitive edge leaving the arena that I used to as a player or as a coach. Uh, and that's refreshing, but also part of the game that I truly miss. Some nights, you know, you might not, we all make mistakes and we all don't have our best days on TV, but some nights, do you feel like hard on yourself when you don't have your best nights calling the game? No, because <laughs> I always think, you know, I'm fortunate enough, as you guys can attest to, I'm playing with greatness. So when I'm no sitting question. beside Jeff Van Gundy and Mike Breen, they, right. they mm -hmm. do a tremendous job of carrying the load, of making sure we pick each other up, so we're a total team. Mm -hmm. So night in and night out, we always think we could have done something better, but we truly right. enjoy one another and how we pick each other up. Yeah, we enjoy that too. You uh, recently just mentioned uh, that you kind of missed that competitive edge a little bit from coaching. It is We kind of, uh, on the outside, this is us speaking, we kind of feel like you've been blackballed from coaching. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to use that word. Like I said, that's how Jack and I feel. What are your thoughts? Because to me, like I said in the opening, you're one of the best basketball minds I've heard. Uh, you know, you were a, a floor leader since you can remember a point guard general. You have so much to give to the game, but I just don't feel like you'd be given a fair shake um, as far as being an NBA head coach. Well, I appreciate the love that you guys have expressed. Uh, either I watched it, heard it, or heard about it. So... Uh, I don't take it for granted, and I, I truly appreciate it. Um, but that being said, I'm a guy with tremendous faith. I'm not going to slip my wrist if I never coach again because I believe what the Bible says as far as if you do what you're supposed to do, 
It's a promise from God that I will not withhold any good thing from you. So if I'm not coaching, mm. that means it's not good. As long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I truly believe that the day will come when I have the opportunity to, you know, to walk the sidelines again and lead a basketball team. For three years in Golden State, I had the time of my life impacting players, developing relationships, and changing a culture. And I, I truly was blessed to do that. And I look forward to the opportunity to do it again. I don't believe that no man can blackball me. That door will open up and the opportunity will present itself. I'll be locked and loaded and fully prepared to finish the task. I that's refreshing. That. That's refreshing for me to hear, man. Because you know, you know, like Matt said, we've been two guys that have been fighting for you all this time, and and to hear how at peace you are with it, and to and to understand, I'm big in faith too. To understand that you know my my faith controls everything. To hear you say it like that, you know, I'm kind of comfortable with how things are going now. I just look at it like he's been too good to me. At the end of the day, I got right. fired, and 24 hours later, I was signed to, to go back to ESPN and call the NBA Finals. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like I had the opportunity to sit back and say, man, what is going on? How am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to do that? Or what am I going to do now? Before right. I even was fired, I had another opportunity to go back to, to what I was once doing and be with friends that I have for life. That's amazing. That's you touched on um, changing culture in Golden State. You know, Jack and I played on the We Believe team. They made a, cute, a cool run there, and then they kind of went back to being bad again, and then you came along and completely changed the mindset, the culture, the focus. And I seen it coming up because I was with, I was with the Clippers. So it was almost kind of like we we're a little bit of a, a big brother to you guys, but we would see every time we played you guys like, these young motherfuckers are going to be good, man. They play hard. They play <laughs> together. They have fun. They got some young dogs. And I remember when Draymond, because Chris was the top point guard at the time, and I remember some Draymond said something like, I'm taking... Uh, Steph Curry every day, you know, 10 out of 10 to whatever he said, like Steph Curry is my guy, I don't give a fuck what nobody thinks. And I think that that kind of attitude is something you kind of put on that culture and we give you a lot of respect for getting that thing started. I know Steph gives you a lot of respect for that as well too. Mm -hmm. You win in this league with talent and I was fortunate enough to acquire some incredible talent and continue to improve it with a great organization and great decisions. With that being said, just like you said, we was your little brothers. We were not mm -hmm. ready yet to beat you guys. To me, uh, it, it takes a process. And, you know, we went three years only beating the Memphis Grizzlies two or three times in three years because they were more physical, mm -hmm. they were more experienced, yep, they were more polished, and they were pros. So it's a process. Yep. And what we see today, you can point the finger back to, to, you know, six, seven years ago where they were in the gym grinding. One thing about those guys, they were true professionals. Every one of the guys that I coach, they were they, they bought in from day one and the culture changed. You can say, well, my staff and I played a key role, but you have to have willing basketball players that, that want to do the work, work their tail off, mm -hmm. compete and continue to get better. And I was blessed in that area. No, it was beautiful to see because, like I said, you, you, you laid the foundation. The guys continue to work. And then, you know, Steve Kerr comes in. And I got a chance to play on one of those teams, but just to see the energy, the attitude, and like you said, those guys are leaders without, you know, no disrespect to anyone, those guys can play without a coach. You know, that's how on point they are, how, how much they held each other accountable, you know, how just they were about it was, and it, it was really cool to see and be a part of that. And, say, and saying that, that's not taking anything away from Steve Kerr, who's an outstanding individual right. Uh, right. And, and, and an incredible basketball mind and an incredible coach. You can say I did a good job and Steve Kerr did a great job. Both of those things Absolutely. Can, can, can coincide with one another. Absolutely. So I give him a lot of credit. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah. the one person... Oh, no, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that, go ahead. No, I'll say this. The one person in the world, like people can say, you can say I can coach and somebody else can say I can coach. Somebody else can say I can't coach. The one person beyond a shadow of a doubt that can tell you whether somebody can coach is the person that took the job after them because they mm -hmm. understand... How, what, what they, they had, had to, to teach, to. what they had to instill. Well, when you say to a guy, okay, let's run the floppy action, and they don't have a clue, you know some guys that come from certain colleges. Something wrong. And, <laughs> and the first practice, you say, okay, we're going to blitz the pick and roll. And they say, huh? They, they don't know what mm -hmm. they're doing. But when you got right. the right terminology, the work, right work ha habits, and, and, and you can tell who was taught and who wasn't. So I, right. give, I give Steve Kerr a lot of credit. He's been nothing but fantastic to me. Yeah. No, I if, hope if, that you, if you don't know yeah. the floppy offense, you behind, you lost. <laughs> oh, man, y'all start from zero if you don't know floppy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <But> we, <laughs> we've seen those guys, though. 
Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no. I, I hope I de- hope he didn't come across as taking nothing from Steve Kerr. I think he's great oh, at no, what he's no, doing. No. But I think I was just speaking more to the intelligence of the players. Like I said, it's just it was such a fine tuned machine there, and Steve picked and chose where he needed to, you know, put his influence on his and massaged and let those guys go out there and be great. And and absolutely. they were one of the. One of the best, best teams of all time, you know, one of a historical run, a dynasty, you know what I mean? So it was fun to, to be able to watch and see, like I said, seeing them you know, when I was a Clipper, kind of seeing them as youngsters going through, the, you know, the hard knocks of what the NBA is about, but seeing what they were about and knew, knowing they were going to be good. Absolutely. Let's take it back to uh, the early 80s in New York and what basketball is like and how much talent came out of that area. Incredible talent. Incredible, incredible talent. I think about... My senior year in high school seems like yesterday, but it's 1983, and mm. I was fortunate enough to win a state championship. But that that year was, I'm not saying it, the historians say it was the greatest uh, point guard class in the history of New York City. Pearl Washington, a great college high school player and went to Syracuse University and impacted the Big East from day one, was a point guard in a senior uh, class guy by the name, you may know him, Kenny Smith, was at Archbishop Malloy, went on to North Carolina, and uh, obviously in the league. Uh, The best player as a freshman was a guy by the name of Kenny Hutchinson, who was a 6'6 point guard who started as a freshman and won a city championship in the public school and then went on to play at Arkansas. So four of us was the the, the four key guys as far as point guards uh, in New York City. And right behind us was Rod Strickland. And I mean, we were Mm. loaded with talented, talented players. Uh, but it was it was a fantastic time, and we we'd see each other, you know, during the season. But more importantly, in the summer, playing pickup mm-hmm. ball and playing AAU ball and all of those things, uh, just just the battles were legendary, absolutely legendary. Yeah. So you go to high school in New York, go to St. John's, and then you're drafted by the New York Knicks. Tell me what that experience was like. Well, I'm the only guy that can be claimed by both boroughs, Brooklyn and Queens. I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy, but it's true. I was born in Brooklyn, lived there the first seven years of my life, moved to Queens, and then living in Queens, I went to high school an hour and a half away when I went to when I went in Brooklyn, living in Queens. So, and then the opportunity to play college basketball in New York City was fantastic. I, I, I went and visited different schools, but the opportunity to play for a guy who sat in front of my mother and father and said. Your son will leave this university a better man, or a man. And he kept his promise, and that's Hall of Fame coach Lou Conaseca. And mm. it's funny to me, you guys can relate to this. It's funny to me, I, I, I say to my kids, I got three boys and a girl, but I say to my three boys who play, one is still playing high school ball and the other one's finished. But I talk to them about valuing the relationship with their high school coach. I got one high school coach, used to coach two of my sons, does not speak to me, does not speak to my sons. And I tell you, I sit at the games and say nothing. To this day, calling my 90-something-year-old college coach and calling my 70-year-old high school coach is at the top of my list. We still call each other. I don't call them by their first name. I don't call them by their last name. I'm 55 years old, and I still call them coach and love them to death. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of relationships you're supposed to have if you're truly impacting folks. Mm -hmm. Right. That's amazing. Let's shift to the NBA right now. Um, it was really starting to shape up. We try to explain to people, like, March is that time. You know, as a head coach and a former player, that you're really starting to see basketball. You're starting to see chemistry come together. You know, you're establishing your lineups going into the playoffs. We are seeing some great basketball. What were your thoughts on where we stand with LeBron and the Lakers leading the West and, and Giannis' team leading the East? Well, it was an exciting time. You guys know as former players, uh, this is when you really begin to gear up, and you can truly see LeBron James gearing up. We had a Man, Friday what? Sunday, yeah, we had a Friday Sunday game on ESPN and ABC where uh, the Lakers played the Bucks on Friday, and then Sunday they played the Clippers. Clippers, and we, right? We, we thought we thought going into it, it was really going to tell a lot, not just about the teams, but also about LeBron James and Kawhi Leonard and 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 and, and the Greek Freak. Uh, uh, you, you could see. And the Friday night, LeBron had a chip to him. He had an edge to him. Yes, and sir. He, what I loved is from the jump, as, as, as former players, I'm looking, okay, what's the matchup going to be? Right. Are, are we going to dodge and duck? Or are we going to basically send a message saying, <laughs> I got him? 
And from the opening tip, LeBron James got it, Giannis. And then on Sunday, from the opening tip, got it, Kawhi Leonard. And proved that he is still the best player in the world. It was, it was great to see. And uh, I, I thought it was, it was a time where we were going to turn the corner and begin to get the pecking order as far as playoffs concerned and uh, rev this thing up to see when playoffs did start, who was going to win it all. Oh, it was, it was definitely an exciting time. And I love to see, he, like, he really made Giannis's night tough. Like, it was refreshing to see because I remember at the very beginning of the season, uh, I think, Jack, me and you were doing some ESPN stuff together and was so mad that he didn't go out, got a guard Kawhi like the first yeah. game of the season, whatever it was. And I'm like, this is not, this is, this is, this is a marathon. This is a sprint. He knows when it's going to be time to turn up and, and, and really lock in. And you've always seen him turn his offensive game up at this point of the season. But to see him, uh, you know, dig down and turn up on that defensive end. You know, I remember AD at the beginning of the season said, you know, he wants he, he and LeBron to be on the all-defensive def team. Now, over the stretch of the season, that may be a lot, but I love to see he could still definitely lock up in one of the best players in the world in Giannis. That, that, made, me, that, made, that made me feel good to see that too, Matt. Um, you always see Giannis just back people down and put them in the basket. He could not well, back Bron down. None and, of that and, shit. And, and, je and just to see, like, 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 like Mark said, just to see Bron take that challenge uh, and back-to-back -back nights, I think that's big. And that was, that was scary for the league. That was real scary. And what it, it really inspires your team because we play. Uh, no question. If, if you put a superstar on my team and there's no a superstar question. at the same position on the other team and all of a sudden you don't want to match up, we might not say nothing, but we sitting there saying, "Man, this dude, it, nah, this dude don't want. He don't. He, he don't want it. that smoke. Yeah, he mm -hmm. don't. He don't yeah. want. It. But <laughs> but he took the challenge, and basically, you could tell, you could see the chip go on the shoulder of everybody else in purple and gold because their leader took the challenge. Come on, saying, man. I got Come this. Come on, man. Come on, man. That's how Kobe That's was. It. I love it. I love seeing it. I was excited to see. You know, because everyone's talking. I I I, I like. The Bucks and I like the East. There's some teams in the East, but I honestly think it's going to the champion is going to come out of LA. You know what I mean? So it, it, to me, it's going to be a beautiful thing if it happens. Either the Clippers get their first one, or LeBron gets this one. Uh, you know, cementing his legacy and, and 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 doing it in Kobe's honor. So I I think it's excited, and and, and I really hope we get a chance to play out this season. Well, it's a lot of fun, and there's great basketball yeah. being played. So I look forward to it. We getting back to normal. Right. So what are your thoughts about, as Jack and I spoke about it uh, yesterday, I think, some people say, let's just go right to the playoffs. We knew as former players, we need to restart our engines. We need at least seven to ten games to really get back going, you know, build, pick up that rhythm, pick up that team chemistry, and then, and then going into the playoffs. What are your thoughts, one, on that, and then should we still try to be going seven-game series? Should we shorten them three out of five in the final seven games? What are your thoughts on all that? Uh, somebody suggested yesterday in an interview I was doing a single game elimination, which is absurd to me. That makes no mm -hmm. sense. And then mm -hmm. I think it's important, again, as former players and as a former coach, it's important that we don't go right back to playing basketball because I don't care what these players are doing around the world right now. It's not the same. Nothing, nothing is the same as getting in the gym playing five on five. Right, nothing right. you do. They can, you they can't can be simulate on, it. They can be on all those machines all day long is nothing like getting in the gym. So we're going right. to need not just those seven to ten games, but we're going to need seven to ten days of practicing and, and getting right. in the gym because guys yes. aren't going to be in rhythm and you're putting yes. guys at risk of also picking up injuries. But I, I, I like the idea of shortening the earlier series, going back to the best out of five or something like that to make sure that we, we're able to, to get all these series in. But I like the idea of playing – real basketball and, 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 and having uh, the playoffs play out once we get back to it. Mm -hmm. All right, we won't keep you too long. Like I said, we want to have you in studio and really just get down to business. But last thing we'll leave you with is the state of the Knicks. Um, you know, someone being from there and knowing how much the fans love the team, appreciate the team, and kind of just the rut they're stuck in. What would be your suggestion or, or thoughts or any kind of ideas you, you can think of to help get that team over the hump? Because I think basketball is better when all of our major cities are relevant in the game. Especially well, the Knicks, man. Especially the Knicks. We all like playing in the garden. That's all our favorite, one of our favorite places to play. When the Knicks not going right, it, it kind of takes a little air out the league, man. Well, it's great for basketball when the Knicks are good. There's no question about that. When they're competing and relevant. Any, any major city... But, but especially New York. I think they did the right thing in, in, in making a change. 
You get a guy like Leon Rose, who's a basketball lifer, knows what he's doing. It's about getting uh, uh, and making the proper decisions by acquiring talent and assets. And I think they're headed in the right direction. Now they, they, they have to make continue to make the proper decisions, but there's no question about it. Basketball is at its best when the Knicks are relevant and it's good for, mm -hmm. for business overall. Absolutely. Last question. Who, who, do, who do you see in the finals? See, hoping that everything plays out and we're, and we're going to get back to basketball. You know, about a, about a month ago, Jeff Van Gundy said to me, nobody in the East could beat the Bucks." And then about two weeks after that, he apologized and said he was wrong, that they can be beaten. I think the Celtics yeah. are talented and deep Celtics. enough to, mm -hmm. to, to, to beat them. Uh, I think the Bucks are clearly the favorite in the East, but I think you, you can't underestimate what Rudy Tomjanovich once said, the heart of a champion in the Toronto Raptors. There's a reason why they mm -hmm. continue to get it done even without Kawhi Leonard. That's a dangerous basketball team. So the East will be, be very exciting. And the West, right. to me, I think it, it's, it's about matchups. I think the, the Lakers and the Clippers are clearly the favorites. I, I, don't, I don't like the fact that the Houston Rockets don't have a big man and that they don't, uh, they're not a defensive juggernaut, juggernaut, but I do think that they can beat other teams not named the Clippers. The, Cl the Clippers can impose their will against them defensively and match up mm -hmm. against them where they put mm -hmm. a stop to it. Somebody else might think, well, we can outscore them. And that's when the Houston Rockets are dangerous. So I think it's going to be exciting, but ultimately I think it comes down to the Lakers and Clippers. Uh, the way that it was ending a couple of weeks ago, the Lakers were the better basketball team. But I mm -hmm. like the Clippers having three guys that they can give the ball to and trust that those guys make a play, whether it's Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, or Lou Williams. Mm -hmm. They can get you a basket or get you a good look. If it's the mm -hmm. Lakers defensively, I can say, okay, Anthony Davis, shoot a turnaround jump shot over me with a contested hand. Or LeBron James, mm -hmm. shoot a contested three. I don't know if they have uh, overall more guys than, than one in LeBron James that can think, get a hoop or make a play on his terms. So that would be the concern. I Who said the same like thing at the beginning of the season. Excuse me, Matt. I said the same thing at the beginning of the season about um, – about Toronto, I felt like without Kawhi, they still had enough experience, championship experience to get out the East. And now, and I even said I even had Miami high because uh, I, I knew with Jimmy, I knew Jimmy would go there and get this team to playing hard, playing with some fire, playing with some passion, and, and it's starting to work. But I didn't, I, I wasn't confident in Milwaukee this year. I mean, they're having a great regular season, but I wasn't confident in them going down the stretch. I don't think they could pull it off. And I already told him LeBron bringing the championship home. <laughs> I really like, I, I really like, I, I, to me, it's just disappointing. You think year after year with all the talent Philly has that, that you know, it's time that the, that process paid off. You know, they were my early, pre, uh, my early season picks. Who are they, but, though, Matt? Matt, who are they? What, are, what, are they they, have, what is their identity? They don't have an identity. They don't have a true leader, whether that's Ben Simmons not being vocal enough or Joe Embiid not really embracing. Because sometimes we all know the best player is not necessarily always the leader. It's just how right. it is, and, and you can't force it. It is what it is, you know what I mean? So it, it just, I don't know what their identity is to answer your question, but I really like Boston and the way they're playing and their chemistry with Kimba, and they have two young stars that, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. leaps that they didn't get a chance to take with Kyrie, they've taken this year again, and they've shown their progress. And you got two guys that can get you 25 every night easily, but sometimes, you know, 30, 35, you know what I mean? So I really like mm -hmm. Boston and what they're doing. And then I love Marcus Smart, ultimate glue guy. Um, so it's going to be interesting East. And, you know, like I said, scary. Houston can beat anybody. They just can. But can they consist in a seven-game series? Is it going to work with the size? And we're small ball guys. We love small ball. But we just also know how hard it is the further you get in the playoffs, you know. So yes, it, it's going to be fun, and I hope we get a chance to see it, man. I hope we get a chance to see it. Well, you make a good point about Philadelphia. It is a shame that we don't mention them right away because talent-wise – they're good enough not just to win the East, but they can match win up with anybody and win it. But, the, right. but something's not clicking with them. Hopefully they get it right because they, they have the talent. You don't want to, The worst thing to do as, as players is to look back years later and say what you could have done. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's, that's, what we, that's what we're doing now, man. That's what we're doing <laughs> now. But, man, hey, thank you for your time, Mark. We appreciate it. We pray for you and your family's safety. And uh, like I said, once all this clears up, we got to get you in studio, man. I look forward hold to on, it, Hold man. on, hold on, hold before on. We, before we get off, OG, remember the conversation we had when we was at our wonderful breakfast spot? I told you, if you ever get a coaching job, which I think is going to happen, and you need your boy to come and straighten some guys out, just <laughs> save me a spot on that roster. 
I know that's the truth. I got both of y'all, man. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it, my man. Hold on. <laughs> Did I'm you shocked, say roster man. or coaching staff, Jack? You said roster <laughs> yeah, or coaching staff. staff. Yeah, co coaching staff. Let's get that clear. Coaching staff. Yeah, that's what I say. Your old ass is not taking wrong. up no motherfucking <laughs> roster spot. <laughs> y'all doing everything great. Y'all off the charts. Love and appreciate y'all, man. Keep rolling. What is, man, appreciate uh, what, you, OG, man. Thank man, you keep for spending going. some time with us, man. God bless you and your family, man. Thank God you. God we'll, bless, we'll see my you brother. Soon, Thanks. Man. God bless, fellas. Hey, that's a wrap. Uh, special quarantine edition with uh, Mark Jackson, my brother Jack. Good work. Good work. Good job, boy. Um, this episode you can find on Showtime Basketball YouTube or all platforms streaming podcasts. All of them. This life was all I ever wanted. I'm not leaving. Not yet. I was hoping you'd say that. We gotta hit the streets, make some money. People like us must destroy people like him. Buckle up. Get Showtime free at Showtime.com.